today as we come to the table. I've seen people, you know, from the side, they're like, wow, that looks just like, and I walk around and they look nothing. It's amazing how different they are from the front than they are from the side or from the other side or from the back or whatever. This is what the Lord wants us to recognize. He wants us to see him from the front. He wants us to see him from the back. He wants us to see him from each side, every possible angle that we can look at the Lord. He says, I want you to see me that way. I want you to know me from every way because I know you from every way. I want you to know me from every way. And the reason being is we need him in every way. We need him when life is hard. We need him when life is easy. We need him when things are up. We need him when things are down. And every one of us need him from some angle. Why are there four different Gospels? Why do we need four different accounts of the story of Jesus? Our faith hinges on Jesus, and so it's important to know Him completely from every angle. In his message today, Pastor Mark will teach you that you have the four Gospel accounts to get a full 360-degree picture of Jesus. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. In what way do you need Jesus today? Do you need to be reminded that Jesus is your Savior? Do you need to know that He is God? Do you need to remember that He knows exactly what you're going through because He experienced life just like you did? However you need to see Jesus, you can take in the full picture. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John chapter 1 with today's edition of Come to the Table. We're going to be in the book of John. And if somebody asked me earlier, they said, are we going to go through the whole book? I said, you better believe it. We're going through the whole book, line by line, verse by verse. Now, don't be discouraged because the first couple of weeks, we're going to cover probably four or five verses. But then we're going to speed up after that. Don't worry. So we'll go at a faster clip than a couple of verses a week. But I wanted to cover just a couple of verses this week and two or three verses next week because this is so chock full of doctrine that we need to understand as a church and that our society around us needs to know. And we need to know where it is and where to find it and how to share it with them. So we're going to take some time looking here at the first part of John. So John chapter 1, look what it says in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Let's pray. Lord, what a powerful couple of verses. It's amazing to me that you can say so much in so few words that there can be such power in something that is so concise and to the point. But that's the God that you are. You are the Word. You are God. You can do all things. And I pray that as we go through this study in the book of John, God, that you would magnify your name. And I pray these next couple of weeks especially, that your name would be magnified. That's our desire, Lord, is to lift up your name and for us as believers to see you for who you truly are and not to forget the God that we serve and how big you are, but Lord, that we can also show that same glory to the world around us, that we might be used to magnify the name of Jesus. Because Lord, when your name is magnified, it works as a magnet drawing men to you. So God, open your word to us. We pray you would teach us now and Lord, bless our journey through the book of John as you reveal yourself to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1. Again, Jesus magnified. Next couple of weeks, you're going to be looking, first of all, this week at John uh, covering Jesus being magnified as Almighty God and the Word. That's where we'll focus on today. And then next week, we're going to look at Jesus magnified as the Creator and light Himself. So we'll cover these things and look at them. And again, these, uh, for a lot of believers, are going to sound like basic doctrines. But I think that for the church, it is good on a regular basis to be reminded of who Jesus really is because we forget sometimes. We say that we don't forget. We say we know Jesus, and we do. But sometimes when we face issues in our life, we forget how big our God is. And some of you are facing issues right now that seem overwhelming. 
They seem larger than you can handle. It is out of your control, but it seems something that's overwhelmingly out of your control. What my heart today is that we see Jesus magnified afresh and anew so that you realize, although it may be out of your control, it's very much within his control and his grasp, and he has the power to deal with it. So whatever you're facing this morning, right now, some of you may not be in the midst of that hard trial. Some of you may not have that mountain that you're standing looking up at saying, how tall can this thing be? But some of you are. And you're saying, this is exactly the message I need to hear. This is going to be you, what Jesus has for you, him being magnified to get your eyes back on the glory of our God. But there's going to be some of you that may have never known Jesus this way. Maybe you've known Jesus as a good man, as a great prophet, as whatever the case might be, like the world says. And maybe you're not even a believer, and that's all you've ever viewed him as. My hope that is, before we're done today, that you see Jesus in a whole new light. That he's not just a good man, that he's not just a prophet, that he's not just another spiritual leader, but that he is much, much more. And that is what John is going to expound on today, even at the very first of the book of John. Now, it's interesting, in Psalm 34, 3, it says this. The psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And I love the whole mindset of magnifying, magnify the Lord with me, lift up his name, exalt him. Because again, when Jesus is magnified, he draws people to himself. And I especially like the terminology of magnifying because it's something that to me as a young boy, I saw the power of magnification. Now, this might not seem like something you would associate with Jesus and being magnified, but I can remember being a little boy and I don't know what grade it was in or what it was, but I was a little bit of a stinker. And I remember, I guess, all little boys, maybe at that age, I don't know, um, still some today, I guess. But either way, I remember being close to the window in my class, whatever class it was. And I don't know if I got the magnifying glass off the teacher's desk or if I brought it from home. But I learned really quick early on that the dead flies in the window, if you angle the magnifier just the right way when the sun's coming in, not only can you light those boys up, but they'll smoke. And I'll tell you something else. If you catch one that's alive and get him and he's not paying attention, you can light that boy up too. And they literally, I remember one time smoking so bad I had to stop and I'm hoping the teacher didn't see it. I'm doing this with the smoke of this dead fly coming up around me. And I learned early on that magnification not only makes things larger and brighter, but it lights them up. And so as we magnify Jesus going through the book of John, as we magnify Jesus these next couple of weeks, looking at him being as God Almighty and being the creator and being light himself, my hope is, is that it lights up your heart, that God magnifies himself so much that the heat of who he is just comes in and gets your heart burning for him again and anew. Again, for some of you, you need that reminder of how great your God is. Again, for some of us, you need to see the Lord for the first time for who he is and put him in his proper place. What do I mean by that? Listen, we have a generation today, and I was talking to Tracy about this either yesterday or just a few days ago. We have a generation today that, believe it or not, even in the South, they don't really know who Jesus is, many of them. You know you grew up in church, you go to church, you're believers, and maybe you're not really a believer and you're here today. So you're going to see God magnified maybe for the first time today as well as we look at how John magnifies him. But the bottom line is we have people today that don't really understand that Jesus is God. They don't understand that he wasn't just another prophet, that he wasn't just another leader of another religion. What makes him any different than Muhammad or anyone else? Everything and in every way. And that's what sets Jesus apart and the Bible apart from every other writing, every other spiritual leader. And we have to know that, be convicted of that, and have the fire as he's magnified in our heart to shine on the world around us about that. Because it's the world's only hope. Jesus is. And so the reason being, again, because, again, I think as a nation, I don't think as a nation, I know as a nation, we've gotten away from the word of God as our standard. We were founded on the Word of God as a nation. It's easy to go back and see in our founding fathers. But we've gradually removed the Lord, as you guys know, from our government, from our schools, from everything else. And because of that, we're raising up a generation that doesn't really know who he is. And if they know who he is, and many of them do know who he is, they don't really know who he is. They don't understand who they're dealing with. He's just another in a long line of religions and religious people. And you know what? You choose the one that fits you the best and you like it and you go with it. What they don't understand is he's the only way to get into heaven. The Bible says we're all going to die and we're all going to stand before God and there's going to be a judgment day and only those who believe in the Jesus of the Bible. And by the way, let me magnify that. Not just a Jesus that's out there. Have you noticed there's lots of Jesuses? Everybody's got a Jesus. Ask him about it. I love Jesus. My Jesus would never. Well, you know what? You've got to find out who the real Jesus is. 
based on the word of God. And that's the Jesus you have to believe in. And if you don't believe in that Jesus, the Bible says you won't get into heaven. Jesus said many are going to stand there before him on that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord. You're going to call him Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? What they're doing, I'm not quite sure, but they're going to be claiming they did and that they are. And the Lord's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. And the Bible says they'll be cast into eternal fire, separate from heaven forever. So this is a big deal. It's not just believing in Jesus. It's getting the right one. And when you see who Jesus really is based on his word and you magnify who he is and let him set your heart on fire, that's when you're going to be able to set other hearts on fire by sharing who that Jesus is. And so, again, it's interesting. Jesus said to his disciples because he wanted to make sure that his disciples knew who he was, not what other people thought of him. He said, hey, guys, first of all, he said this, who do men say that I am? And so they said, well, you know, Lord, some say you're a great prophet. You're like Elijah or Jeremiah resurrected or you're, you know, whatever this and that. He said, they say these things about you. He said, okay, great. Who do you say that I am? I know the world's going to think all kinds of things. They're going to think I'm one in a long line of spiritual leaders. They're going to think I'm just another religion. I'm reaching them. My spirit will go after them, but you're my followers. Who do you think I am? I want you to know. And that's why we as believers have to be solid in doctrine, that is teaching, of what it says here in John, as well as the rest of Scripture. We need to be students of Scripture. That's why we go line by line and verse by verse through the Bible, so we'll know this kind of stuff, and then we can share with people who Jesus really is. John is going to reveal to us Jesus, again, is much more than what the world thinks. They begin to say who they were, and of course that's when Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the Savior of the world. And he said, way to go, Peter. You know, you you didn't figure that out on your own. You know, God showed you that. And we didn't figure this out on our own either. God showed us this by his word. And John is going to reveal again that Jesus is the word, but he's also almighty God. And that's quite a bit different than just any other man, if you will, or a good man or whatever you want to call it. Now, we need some background before we jump into John. Um, As you know, John is one of four gospels. John was one of the closest disciples of the Lord. He's the same one that wrote the book of Revelation. So when you see the book of John, the book of Revelation, this is the same man that God used. We know God wrote it, but he's the same man that God used to pen uh, the writing, if you will. He's the one who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I'm sure that he wasn't exclusively saying he loves me and he doesn't love anybody else. I think that John was just reflecting the fact that Jesus was so magnified to him that he recognized how much he was loved. Do you recognize how much you're loved? I mean, do you really grasp it? This is church. Is that all it is? Or are you here having a relationship? You're loving Jesus. We're going to be hearing his word in a moment. And you're saying, Lord, this is what I want. This is you. This is life. There's a relationship. See, this is what true relationship is. John had that with Jesus. And because of that, John said, I'm the one whom he loves. When you have that relationship, you know that Jesus loves you. There's no question in your mind because he shows you that he does. And so he was very intimate with the Lord in the spirit realm. He was also very intimate with the Lord on the earthly level as well. That is, he saw him as a man. He saw him live as a man, the way he functioned among other people and knew him as a person on the earth. So we're going to see him reflecting Jesus in the spirit as well as a person and who he was. Uh, John, as you know, is the fourth of the four gospels or what we would call the direct accounts of the Lord's life, which brings up a question, why would God give us four different accounts of the life of Jesus? You know, why didn't God just write the gospel and tell us everything that he wanted in there? Because God wanted us to know him from every possible angle. You know, it's funny. You ever seen somebody standing there and you look at him and think, that looks just like so-and-so. And and you go and you turn around and go, that does not look like so-and-so at all. You ever done that? I've seen people, you know, from the side that I think, wow, that looks just like, and I walk around and they look nothing. It's amazing how different they are from the front than they are from the side or from the other side, or from the back, or whatever. This is what the Lord wants us to recognize. He wants us to see him from the front. He wants us to see him from the back. He wants us to see him from each side, every possible angle that we can look at the Lord. He says, I want you to see me that way. I want you to know me from every way, because I know you from every way. I want you to know me from every way. And the reason being is we need him in every way. We need him when life is hard. We need him when life is easy. We need him when things are up. We need him when things are down. And every one of us need him from some angle. Some of you need to know you're loved. You need to know you're loved, that God loves you. And so his spirit's going to reveal to you from that angle that he loves you. 
Some of you, you need a good swat on the spiritual behind. You're doing stuff you know you shouldn't do, and you don't need somebody to go, oh, you're so cute. You need somebody to say, what are you doing? Stop doing that right now because you're going to lead yourself to a problem in your family and your life. And he's got that spiritual swat because he loves you. It's exactly what's happening. Some of you need him from whatever angle you need Jesus from. He is here and he is complete. And I think the problem that many people make in the world about the Lord and that we do as well and are forming our viewpoint of him is we grab onto what our favorite angle is and we hold on to it without looking at the other angles. Some of you, you only want to see him as a God of love. You don't want to see him as a God of judgment, but guess what he is? He's also a God of judgment. Some of you only see him as a God of judgment. Everything you do, I'm in big trouble now. God will never forgive me, and I know I can't go to heaven. Now, guys, I want to show you another angle. You need to see that I love you, that I'm merciful, that I forgive you. So the four Gospels are there for a very specific purpose. So you can see the Lord from every possible angle and understand him in his fullness. Again, and even though the four Gospels reveal many of the same things throughout the Scripture, they have specific purposes. For example, Matthew reveals Jesus as a king. He's the king of all the universe. So when you read through Matthew, you're going to see his majesty, his kingliness. What about Mark? Well, Mark reveals him as a servant. You think, wow, God was a servant? Yes, God, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Which again, we see him in his majesty as a king, but we also see him serving, which means we need to be serving. He set an example for us. If God can serve, then I certainly can. So we see him as a servant. Luke reveals him as a man. And sometimes we see God and we can't associate with him. You know, how can I associate with God? He's this being that's so great. He became a man so we could associate with him. That we could see him walking around and hear his voice and read about his life. He did that for us. So we have that connection to him in humanity. And then John reveals him as God. Now we're going to see also John revealing the Lord as love. He speaks a lot of the Lord's love. And John was known as the apostle of love. But we're going to see him revealing Jesus as God, which not only he'll do here in the very first couple of verses, but throughout the whole book of John. And again, as I said, we need the Lord from all angles in order to be able to understand him from all angles. And this is why certain uninformed critics try to say that the Gospels have contradicting accounts, because they don't understand that all four Gospels work together to give you the full picture. If you're going to see something completely, you've got to see it in 360. But a lot of people will read one, you know, angle of the Lord and say, well, then they'll read another angle of the Lord and they think there's a contradiction. No, Jesus is complete when you look at him as a whole and the four Gospels give the completed picture of Jesus at least as best as we can grasp it in these bodies and on this earth. We'll see him greater when we're there. But the way we can do it, that's what he's given us here. And they all tell the same story of what he's done just from different viewpoints. Now, again, um, This is where oftentimes in Scripture we need to learn certain doctrines. And I guess what's in my heart is I want you guys to remember where it is that it says certain things. Because one of the things you're going to hear that John is going to hit really hard right at the very first of the book of John is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God. I hear that accusation. Nowhere in the Bible. Well, I would everywhere in the Bible it says that Jesus is God. We could do a whole teaching of all the places all over the place. This one is a huge one. And so... You need to know where it says that Jesus was God, and you need to know where to find where it says that Jesus was God, so that if somebody comes to you and says, well, the Bible doesn't say that, that you can point to it and say, yes, the Bible does say that, and here's where it is. You need to know where the Bible says that Jesus is love. And you need to be able to go to the Bible, say the Bible says that Jesus is love, and it says it right here, and you show it to them. You also need to know where it says that Jesus is also going to judge one day. And you'll be able to lead people to that and say, you know what? He is a God of love, but you're resting in him too much thinking you're going to get into heaven because you're being nice. If you don't repent of your sin, you're not getting in. And here's what the Bible says is going to happen to those who don't repent. You see, we've got to present him in his fullness. And so this is why, again, the four Gospels are so necessary. And uh, the book of John, as we study it, in just revealing who Jesus is. It's interesting, John 14, 9, Jesus said this to his disciples, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Another thing people will sometimes say is, well, you know, if I could just see God, if I could just understand who God is, if you want to see God and understand who God is, read the Gospels. Jesus said, I am God, and this is what I'm like. Read me, study me, see what I'm like. I have come to you as a man. I'm revealing myself to you. And so we can learn who he is and know who he is um, and understand, uh, again, who he is in his completeness. Now, another purpose of the book John reveals to us in John chapter 20, verse 31, 
where John says this. This is one of the reasons he wrote the book of John. He said, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So again, that you might be saved. So John will show that Jesus is God. He will show that Jesus is the Word. He'll show he's the Creator. He'll show that he's light. He's going to show all these things. He's going to show him as living among us and love incarnate. But he's also going to show us that without Jesus, you can't be saved. But through Jesus, all can be saved. Now, something else that we need to understand before we jump into our two verses today is while the other gospel writers started at the beginning of Jesus as a man and his earthly ministry, John goes all the way back to eternity. John just jumps the whole thing. He skips the whole, here's how he was born. Here's this, he just, boom. He's God. He is, and he's always been God. And this is a very appropriate place to begin if you are the author of a book that's writing about who Jesus is and the fact that he's God. Because again, if you're going to see that he's God, you've got to realize that Jesus has always existed. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I didn't understand that. I didn't know Jesus had always existed. I thought he started one day, almost like 2,000 years ago. But once you understand, no, he's eternal. He simply stepped into time. It changes everything. And then when you begin to understand that Jesus has always existed and that he was always involved and he is the word of God with God's people, you see him everywhere. You see him in the wilderness. Jesus is with them in the wilderness. He's supplying the manna. He's taking them to where they get drink. He's making sure that there's a covering, a cloud over the heat that's keeping them from, you know, roasting in the wilderness and all that. And then we see him over with the disciples in the New Testament, leading them through the desert, not the desert, but the wilderness as well, and wondering where they're going to get food. And I always think that Jesus is with them. He led these millions of people through the wilderness. He's with his disciples, and there's just a few thousand, four or five thousand. Compare that to over two million. And which neither one is a big deal to the Lord. And they say, Lord, where are we going to get food for all these people? And I'm thinking in his mind, he's going, manna from heaven for 40 years. I supplied over millions of people and millions of meals a day. And you're wondering how we're going to do this. Just have them sit down, guys, and relax. Relax. I'm God Almighty. I have all power, all authority. There is nothing too hard for me. And right now, some of you are thinking about your situation and going, God, you can't help. It's too big. This is impossible. There's no way. I'm doomed. And the Lord, I think, is looking at you with a smile, the same way he did those disciples saying, Lord, how are we going to feed all these thousands? How can we do this? And he's saying, if you only knew who I really was, and if you only really understood my power at this moment, you would breathe out and relax. Now, he doesn't always do it our way and our timing, does he? I want him to do it now. And so I think if I talk louder and faster, I'll get his attention. Doesn't work that way. I just have to say, you're God and you have all power and I'm going to trust you. I have no idea how you're going to deal with this, but I know you can and I know you will. And I know I'm your child, so you're going to. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table. The voice you've just heard is none other than that of Pastor Mark Kirk. Come to the Table is an outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee. Pastor Mark is currently teaching verse by verse through the New Testament book of John. This is one of the four gospel books of the Bible. What that means is that it's one of four accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus while here on earth. John brings up many miracles and proofs of Jesus being both God and man. Jesus met with people. He got tired, he cried, and he had a biological family. But he also performed miracles, raised people from the dead, and fed a crowd of people with one boy's small portion of food that multiplied. These two worlds colliding between his humanity and being the God of the universe can be hard for us to wrap our minds around. But John's eyewitness accounts of these happenings make it all the more convincing. To listen to more teachings like this one, head over to thewaymedia.net. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary Knoxville this Sunday. We want to meet you. Find service times at thewaymedia.net. Scroll down the page to find a link to Calvary Knoxville. As our time comes to a close today, we want you to know that we're thankful for you. And we pray that these messages make an impact in your daily life. Join us next time as Pastor Mark continues to teach more about the life and ministry of Jesus. 
There are so many things we can gain from following Jesus' example that he laid out for us in his word. That's all for today on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.